Globalization has become a pretty popular term nowadays. It's so popular that there is even a political ideology advocating for it, called globalism. We reject the ideology of globalism. Globalist. Globalist. The term seems to have become a buzzword for large cosmopolitan organizations, politicians and presidents, and reporters and conspiracy theorists alike. The globalist! It seems like the term globalization has gone global. But what is globalism or globalization? Why did it come about? And how has a quaint historical term become the spirit of the age? The popular theory amongst historians is that globalization began at some point. Yeah, I know, really insightful, but hear me out. As A-level politics students learn, globalization refers to the process by which the world's local and regional economies, societies, and cultures have become integrated through a global network of communications, transportation, and trade. Since it is a process, we can infer that globalization is an action and not an instance. But where did this action begin? Many historians, political scientists, and geographers attribute the founding of globalization with the Industrial Revolution since the technology and techniques produced during that time period between the 1760s until the late 19th century allowed people to communicate, travel, and trade on a truly global basis. Trade was established, people flowed back and forth, and connections between every part of the world accelerated. Seems convincing, but we'd be forgetting one huge adventurer completely, Christopher Columbus. Through Chris, humanity got something called the Columbian Exchange which is the exchange of food, materials, diseases, and knowledge between what became known as America and the Old World. For example, the Americas got wheat, cattle, and measles, and the Old World's got tomatoes, potatoes, and syphilis. However, this brought about a new kind of economic and social reality that guided two major parts of the world together. So this was the instance. Trade was established, people flowed back and forth, and connections between every part of the world accelerated. Obviously, the Columbian Exchange was the start of globalization, right? Well, maybe not, because there was someone else almost as popular who has been thought to inspire Columbus and bring the world much closer together. His name? Marco Polo. A guy so adventurous, we named a game about blindly searching for someone after him. But that wasn't even his greatest achievement. His greatest was allegedly traveling all the way from Italy to China and bringing back to Europe the appetite of Eastern goods. Why is this important, you might ask? Well, this facilitated a European desire to trade and search out goods that they otherwise did not have. Especially after the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople and cut off all trade with the West. Goods were scarce and Europeans had to, well, explore new trade routes. It was well known that Columbus and other travelers were actually looking for a shorter pathway to these exotic Eastern goods. So it would be logical to assume that it's with Marco Polo that we can say establish the roots of globalization. But you'd be wrong again, since Marco Polo was only able to travel far into the east because of the vast trade network that was protected by the Mongol Empire, which itself was probably the first truly global power, establishing what historians like to call the Pax Mongolica, or the Peace of the Mongols. But before the Mongols, there was the Abbasid Caliphate, who established a truly international network of people and unified them with a single language, but before them was the Sassanid and Roman empires that dominated their respective region and, well, I think you get the point. Some of you might start to see a pattern here, and I don't blame you. A lot of historians did as well. Which led to a man named William McNeil and his theory of world history. In his book, The Human Web, McNeil and his son essentially state that the history of humankind is basically the history of establishing global networks. The motor of history is the interactions we make as human beings and those interactions drive us together in the forms of both cooperation and conflict. The connections and interactions that we make tie the web, where the web ties together, is where flashpoints happen. So Marco Polo, traveling to China, created conflict and cooperation. Columbus landing in the Americas created conflict and cooperation. And the Industrial Revolution created conflict and cooperation. And so did the countless web bindings that happened before them, Globalization isn't an inevitability either, as a McNeil show us with the dilapidation of webs like post-Roman Western Europe and the end of the Mayan and Mycenaean societies. As complex societies form because of the web, these societies have a tendency to create inequality and social stagnation. You can see instances like this today in anti-globalist movements that themselves hold ideologies that are antithetical to the way that the current hierarchical system operates. 
such as nationalism and socialism. I do not mean to draw upon the current political climate for ideological reasons, but rather to show that the modern conflict between globalism and nationalism is a movie that has been played thousands of times before. Globalization isn't an instance, but a process, and not a relatively new process either. It is a process that's happened to humanity since the beginning. Whether it was hunter-gatherer tribes exchanging goods or a laborer on his laptop in Budapest sending quarterly reports to his boss in Hong Kong, the exchange of goods, services, and ideas have been with us since the start. If we can make sense of history, then I agree with McNeil. McNeil has a somewhat fatalistic view of human society. It is a social organization that is shaped by its geography, time, and climate. Through its efforts to consciously change and adapt, the human organism has created the most complex form of social web that not even the unisocial insects such as ants and termites have come close to creating. But because of these complex social networks, the human organism has always found itself out of place and fighting the powers that be, for better or for worse. This has been The 10,000. Thank you for listening.